Good morning, everybody, and uh, Happy New Year to each one. May God bless you in uh, 2023. May He apply all those promises that you read a few minutes ago to your hearts and to your families. We're going to continue our study in the book of Galatians this morning, and uh, I've asked this question as an introduction. What do we do with the Old Testament? I put a paper in my Bible this morning. The first part of the paper uh, is, this is the Old Testament of your Bible, and this is the New Testament. So, as you can see, about three quarters of your Bible is actually composed of the Old Testament. And uh, Christians throughout the ages have been wondering, well, just what is the relationship between the Old Testament and the New Testament, and between the Old Testament and my life today? And uh, theologians have been asking this down through the ages, even from the very start. There was a theologian about in the second century, his name was Marcion, and he said, well, the Old Testament, let's just rip it out of our Bible, okay? Throw it away, and we'll just keep the New Testament, and there was even a couple of books in the New Testament that he didn't think were, were quite right. They were too Jewish, in his opinion, and so he, he took those out too. Well, that would be extreme, right, to, to do that. But maybe in, in yourself, as you read the Old Testament, you come across all these strange laws, like which sacrifice to do on which day, uh, uh, for which sin, uh, what to wear and not to wear, what to eat and not to eat, and uh, where you have to go to worship and where you shouldn't go to worship, and uh, stories of bloody wars and things like that. And, and you can wonder, well, what, what is the relationship between that and my life? And that was exactly the question that the Galatians were asking, really, uh, because uh, Paul had presented Christ to them, and then some other people had come along, some uh, Jews from Jerusalem, and said, okay, great, you believe in Christ? Now, uh, you need to become Jews. Okay, you need to be circumcised. Look at all this, all of these books in your Bible. It was actually the only Bible they had at the, at the time, and the Old Testament. And he said, look, you have to be doing these sacrifices. You have to be doing this and that. Uh, and uh, so they were very confused. And they were asking this question, what should we do with the Old Testament? And uh, almost all the purpose of Paul in Galatians is to answer that question. And particularly the text we will read this morning answers that question. So we're going to uh, read it this morning. He talks a lot about the law and about faith. And when he's talking about the law, he's referring to the laws of the Old Testament, okay, not to the to the Roman law or, or any other law. I, uh, the text is rather long, so I allowed myself to skip a few verses, just for purpose of going faster and for simplicity. But uh, at the house, read, read it all for yourself. So I'm starting at Galatians chapter 3, verse 18. The great gift that God has for us does not depend on the law. If it did, it would no longer depend on the promise. But God gave it to Abraham as a free gift through a promise. Then why was the law given at all? You see, this is Paul's question. This is what he's going to answer today. Why was the law given at all? It was added because of human sin. So it is the so is the law opposed to God's promises? Certainly not. But Scripture has locked up everything, we could say everyone, under the control of sin. It does so in order that what was promised to Abraham might be given to those who believe. The promise comes through faith in Jesus Christ. Before faith in Christ came, we were guarded by the law. We were locked up under it until this faith was made known. So the law was put in charge of us until Christ came. And he came so that we might be made right with God by believing in Christ. But now, faith in Christ has come. 
So the law is no longer in charge of us. So in Christ Jesus, you are all children of God by believing in Christ. This is because all of you who were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. You have put him on as if he were your clothes. There is no Jew or Gentile. There is no slave or free person. There is no male or female. That's because you are all one in Christ Jesus. You who belong to Christ are Abraham's seed or Abraham's children. So you will receive what God has promised. Here's what I've been saying. I'm going to use an illustration from everyday life in the first century. As long as your own children are young, they are no different from slaves in your house. They are no different even though they will own all the property. People are in charge of the property and other people are in charge of the children. The children remain under their care until they become adults. At that time, their fathers give them the property. It is the same with us. When we were children, we were slaves to the basic spiritual powers of the world. But then the chosen time came. God sent his son. A woman gave birth to him. He was born under the authority of the law. He came to set us free. Pardon me. He came to set free those who were under the authority of the law. He wanted us to be adopted as children with all the rights children have. Because you are his children, God sent the spirit of his son into your hearts. He is the Holy Spirit. By his power, we call God Abba. Abba means father. So you aren't a slave any longer. You are God's child. And because you are his child, God gives you the rights of those who are his children. Let's ask uh, God to help us understand this text through prayer. Father, uh, we, we do want to understand your word, but not only intellectually, we want it to seep down into our heart this morning uh, so that we may love you more, so that we may be more like Jesus Christ, so that we may serve you better through the power of your spirit. Amen. I'm, I'm going to try and do a little... Uh, chart here to uh, just to give a short resume of what Paul is doing in this text. Uh, he's talking about three phases in God's eternal plan of revelation. Three phases characterized by three different people, by Abraham, by Moses, by Jesus. Okay, first phase is Abraham, 2,000 years before Christ, that's 4,000 years ago, which is a long time ago. God gave a promise to Abraham. Abraham didn't deserve it. It was just grace shown to Abraham. He said, Abraham, I'm going to give you lots of children, as many as the stars. I'm going to give them a lamb. I'm going to bless you. I will be your God. You will be my people. I will dwell with you. And uh, one day, through your children, all the people in the world will be blessed. That was the unconditional promise given to Abraham. It was free. It was grace. About 600 years later, the children of Abraham were slaves in Egypt. And God sent Moses to deliver them around 1400 before Christ. And uh, Moses was given law uh, to the people. And uh, this law was to instruct them about who God was and what God expected of them. This law in God's economy, in God's dispensations, in God's uh, regime, uh, it was meant to be temporary and conditional. They had to obey this law or uh, God got up and left them or sent them out of their country. We see that all through the Old Testament. And then comes Jesus, 2,000 years after Abraham, and it is through Jesus that the promise made to Abraham uh, will be given to all peoples. And, and Jesus is going to fulfill the promise given to Abraham. He's going to fulfill the law. He will obey perfectly 
the law of God, and he will take on himself the punishment that the law uh, is demanding of all people. And in this way, he fulfills the law, and he, he, he brings us into a new kind of relationship with God, a different kind of relationship than had uh, some people from the Old Testament. And he uses a, uh, an illustration uh, in the first century Roman world, uh, a house, a fairly well-to-do family, in their house they would have children and they would have slaves. And uh, Paul said, look, uh, your children, when they are minor, before they, they have full rights as an adult, uh, there's something like the slaves in your house. They have to do what you tell them to do. Uh, they, they are not the owners. They have to learn. And you put people in charge of them to teach them, like tutors, uh, pedagogues, to, to help them to learn their responsibilities and uh, to become responsible adults. And uh, those uh, tutors were quite severe people. They had a, they had a whip and uh, the child had to learn and uh, obey. But one day, uh, those children grew up, became adults, and had full rights as uh, citizens, and became owners of the house, and, uh, and they told the slaves what to do at that point. So there was a difference between the children and the slaves, but there was a time when they were uh, almost had the same status. And uh, Paul is saying that the law was something like those tutors that were training up the, the children so that they could be full adults. But when Jesus came, uh, he said, he's delivered you from that status of being like slaves, and he has made of you children of God. You may notice as you read through the Old Testament, it's quite rare that God is called Father. But when you get to Jesus and the Gospels, he calls him Father in every place. And we are instructed that we can call God our Father. So why did God give the law? I think I could say for three reasons. Of course, this is all very simplified. But first of all, to show us his holiness. Do you remember Russell was teaching one day and uh, he talked to us about presumptuousness, about coming to God irreverent irreverently, coming to God without fearing him, without realizing how holy he was. And all the laws in the Old Testament, when you read them, actually are showing how far God is above us, how holy he is. And uh, in, the, in the tabernacle where uh, the priests could come to do priestly duties, there was one part where they could never go because that's where God was, except the, 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 the high priest once in a year. God was showing us his holiness through all of those laws. And people died, and Russell showed us that, for not obeying those laws. God was really saying, I am holy, be careful. Another purpose of the law is to show us our sinfulness. As we learn about how holy God is, as we learn about what the way he would like us to act and the way he would like us to think and talk, we, we start to measure the distance that separates us from God. And uh, reading the Bible is a little bit like having the Holy Spirit come with a flashlight and visit your house. <laughs> okay, usually in our house, uh, we have some nice parts, you know, that we keep uh, nice and uh, clean so that when people come in, they can, they can sit down and feel comfortable. But we've probably got some drawers. If you open a drawer, it's pretty messy in there. <laughs> And uh, there may be some drawers in our heart, in our minds, that are pretty messy and maybe pretty smelly or maybe pretty ugly in God's eyes. But as we read God's Word, it's, it's almost like a, a scanner or an MRI. You go in this big machine and, and all of a sudden you can see what's happening in your brain. Uh, God shows us what our heart is like. God shows us what our thoughts are like. And, and this is the purpose of his law, is to show us our sinfulness. And then the last purpose of the law, to show us God's holiness, to show us our sinfulness, and to bring us to Christ as the only solution. If I want to be in relationship with God, and I am a sinner, then how can I be in relationship with God? So, so there are many, many pictures 
of Christ in the Old Testament that you can look for as you read through the Old Testament and in the law and in the sacrifices. They're all pointing to, to Christ. They're, they're, they're leading us to Christ like the tutor is leading the child toward uh, an adult age. These three sort of purposes of the law and these three uh, phases that we saw in the one before, Abraham, Moses, Jesus, uh, they are phases that we must go through personally. That's what I'm going to talk about for a few minutes. Have you been through these steps? First of all, have you been attracted to God by his promises? When Jesus came to earth, uh, he talked about one thing specifically all the time. He talked about the kingdom of God. And when you open Mark's gospel, it says he, this is the this is about the kingdom of God. What was the kingdom of God? Jesus was talking about a lifestyle and a world to come that would be full of peace, joy, love, purity, with no wars, no sickness, no children born deformed and things like this. The kingdom of God, a wonderful place, a wonderful existence. And we are attracted to that. And uh, really, that's what God wanted also in the Old Testament through these laws to show what a holy people would look like and what a holy nation would look like, what a holy life would look like. So we, we are attracted to that. Yes, we think Jesus' teaching is so beautiful, the Sermon on the Mount. Yes, I'd like to live that. But then it also has this other effect on us. It's convicting us of sin. It's condemning us. The Sermon on the Mount talks about Christian character. It shows us the type of people we would like to be, but it also at the same time it shows us the kind of people that we are not. So there's, there's a, a feeling of conviction of sin that comes to us as we read through the Bible, through the Old Testament. And I have a, a, a story here to illustrate that. Let's Let's say that uh, you're driving in your car at night and along a country road, quite isolated, and your car gets stuck in the mud. What am I going to do? And far down the road, you see a light and you think, oh, there's a farm down there. Maybe the farm will have, farmer will have a tractor and he could help me uh, get out of the, out the road. And so you, um, you start walking but you know that you've stepped in some mud and you think, well, maybe I'm a bit dirty. But that's okay, and you keep walking. And as you, as you get closer to the light of the farmyard, you see, oh, I have quite a bit of mud, almost up to my knees. And as you get closer, you say, oh, on my thighs also. And as you get closer, you think, oh, man, I've got mud here too. And, and when you get right under the light and, and, you, and you look in the window, you can see your reflection. You, I've got mud on my face too. Well. I've been reading the Bible for about 50 years, trying to, to read it as much as possible, and uh, I see mud on my face. The more I read it, the more I realize in my human nature how far I am from God and what he, what he wants from me. And yet I'm attracted to that kingdom. So what is the solution? It, all of that leads us to Christ. And every day I have to come back to, to Christ and, and uh, I thank him for washing me from that mud on my, my face. And thank, you for the, thank him for the deliverance that we have in him. So you see, we come to Jesus not just because he's a good teacher, not just because he's a good man, but because he's a savior. And he's come to do for us what we could not do for ourselves, face up with the law. When we do come uh, to Christ and believe in him, several things become true about us. And the Apostle Paul in Galatians, he likes to go over and over and over these things. So what I'm going to say now are some things that I've already said, but that we need to repeat because the Bible is repeating them. And if the Bible is repeating them, it's because we need to hear them over and over again. It's, and Paul's goal here is to show the Galatians that there's no reason to go back and start obeying these laws about sacrifices and, 
and food and stuff like that, because you are now adults. Christ has come into your life. You have believed. And there are a number of wonderful things true about you just because you believed. What has changed since we have believed in Christ? First thing, we have been made right with God. This is what the Bible calls justification. He came, Jesus came, so that we might be made right with God by believing in Christ. When we believe, uh, Christ washes us from our sins, and he removes our, our debt, our, our legal debt to, the, to God. It's as if you, uh, you haven't been uh, using your finances very wisely, and you've got a lot of debts, okay? You owe a lot of money for your house, you owe a lot of money for your car, you owe a lot of money for your holidays, you owe a lot of money for the Christmas presents you bought, and so on and so And all of a sudden you realize that your salary isn't enough to pay back your, your debts, and, and you're in trouble with the bank. Okay, the bank is writing you nasty letters and calling you, and, uh, and all of a sudden you learn that you have a rich uncle in America, okay? And he doesn't have any children, and he died, and uh, he has just uh, given you an inheritance of uh, one million euros. All, all your debts are paid back all at once. And now you can walk into the bank and there's no problem. And the, and the teller smiles at you because you've got uh, money to invest, right? Well, when we walk into God's presence, he smiles at us because all of our debts have been paid back by Christ. For us and we've been made right with God another truth we have been united to Christ all of you who were baptized into Christ have put on Christ you have put him on as if he were your clothes as if you were your clothes uh, so when we believe in Christ it's not just uh, intellectual consent to some truths it's a marriage uh, my life is going to be united with Christ's. Uh, I am going to be plunged into Christ's life as if Christ was a, a big bucket of water and I'm just this tiny glass of water and I've been poured into the bucket who's, who's Christ. And that, uh, that is what baptism symbolizes. Okay, uh, in our church, uh, baptism means that uh, and in the New Testament, when, when you believe in Christ, uh, when you have uh, confessed your sins to him and received his forgiveness, uh, and you want to follow Christ as a disciple, you ask for baptism. And we actually plunge people under the water, just like they did in, in the Bible times, because the symbolism is so strong. I am being plunged into Christ. I've been married with Christ. Now my life is Christ living in me. And I am united to him. It's a new identity to the point where he says it's like you're putting on a new pair of clothes. Uh, some clothes can symbolize our identity. Like if I go into the army, I get a new set of clothes uh, which uh, tell me what my identity is. Uh, I had a tiny experience like this uh, when I was a child. I was uh, 10 years old, I think it was the last year of primary school, and uh, there was a road that children had to cross to, to leave school. Not a very busy road, but a little road. And at the time, I th things must have been safer because parents didn't come and pick up the children after school. The children just walked home for lunch and walked home after school. My parents never came to pick me up at uh, school. Uh, maybe there was less danger, I don't know. But, and uh, to help the children cross the street, uh, they took uh, some of the oldest children in school, and uh, so the principal asked me if I would do this, and she gave me a, a white belt that went around my waist and a white shoulder belt that went across here, something like a policeman, and a badge on here, the badge said safety patrol, and uh, she gave me a stop sign and a go sign. and. Uh, that changed the way I felt about myself. 
And, uh, and as soon as the bell rang, I got to get out of school five minutes early, which was a big bonus. And uh, I would go out to the street and I could stop cars and uh, let uh, the children uh, go by. What happened? I had new clothes, but actually those clothes just represented the authority that had been given to me by the principal. And it changed the way I thought about myself. So when we come to Christ and we are uh, baptized into him, uh, we are given new authority as sons and daughters of God and a new clothes, and this clothes is Christ himself. In fact, the word Christian, have you ever heard this? There's the word Christ in the word Christian, and it actually means something like little Christs, little Jesuses. Uh, this, this is our new identity. These, these are the clothes we wear, and it helps us to remember who we are. A third blessing. We become the rightful children of God. He wanted us to be adopted as children with all the rights children have. Because you are his children, God sent the spirit of his son into your hearts. He is the Holy Spirit. And by his power, we call God Abba. Abba means Father. So you aren't a slave any longer. You are God's child. And because you are his child, God gives you the rights of those who are his children. When we adopt a child, that child has exactly the same rights as all of the other children and will inherit in exactly the same way as all of the other children. So Paul is sending a message here to these people who were not Jews, and he's telling them, you don't need to become like a Jew and do all the things the Jews did to inherit that promise given to Abraham of that wonderful kingdom to come. God is giving it to you in Jesus and he's given you his spirit to remind you that you are a rightful heir of Abraham and a rightful heir of God and of the kingdom of God and you will inherit all these things. You will know eternal life in this beautiful kingdom and you are already in this kingdom. And then he, he says something very wonderful. He says, and so since the spirit of God is in you, you can call God Abba. Abba. What, what is this word? It's not a word in English. That's not a word in French. It's not a word in Greek, which was the language that Paul was writing in. Uh, it was a word from another language. It was the word from uh, the uh, Aramaic, Aramean, which was the language that Jesus spoke. So that when Jesus prayed to his Father, he said, Abba. And we find this word in the Gospels, particularly at one spot, when Jesus is in the Garden of Gethsemane, he knows that in a few minutes he's going to be arrested, whipped, spat upon, crucified. And at that time, he prays and he says, Abba, Father. Now, why does Paul use this word Abba, which wasn't a word that the Galatians would understand? In fact, he has to translate it as Abba, which means Father. Why does he use that word? And why do our translators, they've kept the word Abba, which is not one of our words. It's, everybody is trying to tell us this. You can talk to God the Father in the same way that Jesus did, with the same intimacy with the same relationship. Since you have been plunged into the life of Jesus, and Jesus was so close to his Father, you can talk to him in the same way. Isn't that wonderful? When you pray, you don't have to come trembling and uh, fearing and uh, wondering if God wants to listen to you today or not. When you pray, think of God as very good father. Some of us maybe didn't have good fathers, so don't think about your father. Think about a very good father. And uh, uh, think, oh, when I talk to you, Lord, you're, you're just like a father listening to your children. Or think of the way that you want to listen to your children when they talk to you. Another blessing. We are all made one. There's no difference between us. And Paul says, now there's no Jew or Gentile. 
See, the, the Jews that had come from Jerusalem to visit the Galatians, they said, you're not quite like us. You know, you're kind of second-rate citizens. Paul says, no, in Christ there's no Jew or Gentile, no slave or, or rich person, no man or woman. We are all one in Christ. That's a wonderful truth, too, because as human beings, we have this horrible tendency to compare ourselves with other people. I look at someone else and I say, oh, I'll never be as good a Christian as that person. Or I look at someone else and say, oh, I'm a lot better Christian than that person. God doesn't look at us in that way. He looks at us as all his children with the same rights, all of us, to the same inheritance, to the same kingdom. And that's the way we must see ourselves as well. And it's so wonderful because in our world, there's so easily divisions between rich and poor, between black and white, between men and women, between, between so many different things. Last blessing. We are all sons of Abraham. I've talked about this. We don't need to underline it too much. You who belong to Christ are Abraham's seed. You will receive what God has promised to Abraham. You can say to Grandfather Abraham, okay, Grandpa Abraham. And the Galatians could do that also. Actually, all of that, what I've been saying this morning, is about our identity. Who are we really now that we have believed in Christ? Look at these wonderful truths. Let's take dimension. Vertically, towards God, I have been justified. I have been made right with God. Uh, my debt has been erased. And intimately, in, in, my, in my heart, in my, my deepest being, I've been united with Christ. I've been married to Christ. And this is why I've asked to be baptized into Christ. And legally, what is my status? Well, I have been adopted by God into his family, into Abraham's family. And so I will inherit all that God has promised Abraham. And socially, what is my relationship to others? Well, I have been integrated into the family of God, and we are all united and equal with one another in Christ. And, and historically, where have I come from? Where are my roots? Well, we are the, the longed-for children of Abraham. Remember how, how much he wanted to have children, and God showed him those stars. Well, here we are. We are the longed-for, rightful heirs of Abraham. We have roots that go back 4,000 years to Abraham, but much further to eternity past, as God spoke to us, as God thought about us. As we uh, take time of communion, uh, we talked a bit about baptism. I would say that baptism is like the marriage ceremony. <coughs> Communion is like the wedding anniversary. The wedding. So this, is, this is what we are doing today, is remembering that we have been united to Christ. And uh, I've put up some things, just some reminders of the blessings that we found in this text and uh, that you could use to, to praise God as uh, we take the bread and the, the wine this morning.